Hey everybody, welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. Great to have you with me once again as we take a look at five more chapters from the Word of God. Today we have Numbers 24, Psalms 66 and 67, Isaiah 14, and 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, if there's anything again from these chapters that you would like me to comment on or any questions that you have, please feel free to post those in the comment section below. Otherwise, let's take a look at what we've got here. First of all, Numbers chapter 24 is the conclusion to uh, the activity of Balaam. Balaam, remember, this foreign prophet that has come to, uh, been hired by Balak to curse Israel, but so far has only blessed Israel, once again offers several more speeches. Um, first of all, in uh, his first speech here, beginning in verse 3, he talks about how he's gone up on this mountain, he's seen the tents of Israel laid out. Remember the tabernacle in the middle, Judah on one side with the other two tribes, three tribes, three tribes, three tribes, and um, you know all laid out around this tabernacle in the center here with the pillar of fire by day or the by night and the cloud by uh, day. And so just imagine the sight of it all. And Balaam looks at it and sees it. He says, how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. How lovely are your homes, O Israel. They spread before me like palm groves. Clearly the Lord has blessed Israel. And, um, you know, he says, God brought them out of Egypt. He is for him as strong as a wild ox. He devours all the nations that oppose him. There's just no opposing Israel. Look how great they look. And uh, Balak's angry. He's like, Balaam, I'm done with you. Enough. Uh, get out of here. Go home. But Balaam's like, well... I got one more thing to say. And he gives this final message beginning in verse 15 here. And he says, um, I see him. In this. So, so up to this point, Balaam's messages have been about Israel, the nation, right? Especially how obvious it is that God has blessed them and chosen them. But here, his attention turns to a singular he or him uh, for a future Israelite that's going to come. He says, I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. Notice what he says about him. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of Moab's people. Think of Genesis 3.15, crushing the head of the serpent, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. Edom will be taken over. Seir, its enemy, will be conquered while Israel marches on in triumph. A ruler will rise in Jacob who will destroy the survivors of Ir. Now, remember, up to this point, we have no ruler. We have no king. We have, uh, you know, Moses, who has just been appointed by God to lead the people. We have priests who are going to be intermediaries between God and the people, but we do not have a king. Uh, however, the end of Genesis, uh, Jacob did speak to his sons about a future king coming from the tribe of Judah. And here now we have this prophecy from Balaam of this future king that is going to come and, uh, and, and the victory that he will have over Israel's enemies. Um, so this brings us to Psalm 66 and 67, because whenever we get to the Psalms, what do we talk about often? The enemies of Israel, the enemies of the psalmist here. And once again here, praising God in Psalm 66, talking about the greatness of God, uh, because how awesome are your deeds, your enemies cringe before your mighty power, everything on earth will worship you, they will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. So just come and see what the Lord has done. He's going to praise God for his awesome power here. Um, our lives are in his hands. You've captured us in your net, laid the burden of slavery on our backs. You put a leader over us, went through fire and flood, but you brought us to a place of great abundance. So even though it's been through trials as a nation, God has brought us into this awesome place. Um, he says, Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. God listened. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love for me. So here we have a song of praise for what God can do. But then we move into Psalm 67. And once again, we have here a prayer for all the nations that they will recognize God, right? So there's a lot going on with these other nations here in all these passages from uh, Numbers 24, speaking of how the nations of the world, if they don't recognize God, that they're going to be judged. Here in Psalm 67, may your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. So this is, may the nations praise you, right? This prayer that all of the world would recognize God and praise him, which uh, again, so you see it in Numbers 24, you see it here in Psalm 67, and now as we turn to Isaiah 14, 
we have it again, specifically with Babylon, Assyria, and Philistia. And uh, and here, right, God in uh, chapter 13 had brought, brought up this judgment on Babylon that's going to come on them because they were opposed to God's people. Um, and here, specifically, the king of Babylon is uh, discussed here. This He says, as it says here, um, you struck the people with endless blows of rage. You held the nations in your angry grip with unrelenting tyranny, but finally the earth is at rest and quiet. Now it can sing again, right? Because God's brought down the king of Babylon. And really what's uh, what's especially important here, it begins in verse 12, uh, because some people look at this and they read this and they say, Man, this can't just be talking about the king of Babylon, because look what it says about him. How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Okay, everyone there will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? So people read this a lot, commentators, and they say, wait a second, this sounds like we're talking about more than the king of Babylon. And so they point this ultimately to the devil or Satan and what may be going on here, though, is more of a metaphoric language about the king of Babylon here and certainly paralleling him or at least showing that the power behind the king of Babylon, because remember, the king of Babylon is so opposed to God and his people. So the power behind the king of Babylon is uh, Satan himself. And so that's why you have the language that you have here of him you know, ascending to heaven and falling from heaven. Um, because it's, you know, any evil king that opposes the Lord and his people is ultimately, especially the king of Babylon, empowered by Satan here. And so there's uh, kind of like a parallel between the king of Babylon and Satan himself. And so it's a little difficult to say, well, wait, who are we talking about exactly here? We're we just talking about the king of Babylon and metaphorically, uh, you know, uh, saying he's like Satan, or are we saying that this is about Satan here, referred to as the king of Babylon, um, personally, I would take it more that we're talking about the king of Babylon here, but that what's uh, the, the empowering the king of Babylon and his opposition against the Lord is Satan. And so there's, um, you know, so it makes sense that uh, the language here is of the same thing of Satan, of pride ascending to heaven. But I certainly wouldn't make too much of a Satanology out of Isaiah chapter 14 because the devil or Satan's not actually named here. So you got to be really careful in how much you say here. In fact, the term Lucifer even comes from this chapter. It's, you know, nowhere else is, is, is Satan named Lucifer, but it comes from this verse 12 here and in the King James. And so it's not really a good place since we're talking about the king of Babylon to build too much of a Satanology. So just be real careful about that. But anyway, uh, we move on here to a message about Assyria and Philistia, both these other nations facing judgment, facing downfall because of what they have done. Obviously, Assyria, we've talked about before earlier in Isaiah, attacking um, uh, Israel and Judah, and Philistia, of course, a constant thorn in the side of Israel. And so God is going to bring all these nations to ruin. All right, we move then to 1 Peter 2. And once again, we do have the language here of the nations. But first of all, so, uh, you know, he's coming off of chapter one here. He says, basically, continue you know, to live this new life in Christ, like newborn babies. He says, crave pure spiritual milk so that you'll grow. Right. So you're in Christ. So, you know, have that, you know, the milk. Uh, some translations have the milk of the word, thinking that this refers to the word of God, whereby you grow. This is where you are nourished in. Um, then you have this beautiful middle section here where he gives a number of metaphors to uh, represent the church. He calls us uh, a building, a spiritual building, like God's temple, his house. He lives in us. And then also this beautiful uh, verse uh, 9 says, You are not like that. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. What a wonderful promise to think as the church, as the people of God today, that we are this royal priesthood, that we have this representation of being, you know, between the unbelieving world and God, that we have been set apart like the priests were set apart, um, that we have been chosen by God, that we are a holy nation set apart, God's own possession, sons and daughters of, of God. What an incredible promise here. And so as a result, he says, it's so that you can show others the goodness of God. So you can bring others to the light that you have been brought to. Then one other thing here, 
Um, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Right, so we're supposed to live as basically as uh, foreigners on the earth. Right, the world is not our home. We're just a passing through. And so, all right, we have our eyes focused on eternity. That's where real life is. And, and have this perspective that, listen, we're just pilgrims. We're, we're just passing through. We don't have, we don't cling to earthly things uh, the way that the world does. Um, last section here is on respecting uh, those in human authority. Um, you know, whether the king as head of state or officials he has appointed. So similar to Romans 13, Paul's instruction there on obeying the government. All right, that's all we have time for today. Again, we had Numbers 24, Psalm 66 and 67. Isaiah 14 and 1 Peter 2. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your nose in the book. See you again soon.